we're, we're sort of wrapping up the ground. We covered the, the last major topic last week. Uh, so today we'll talk a little bit about the last remaining category of transitive verbs, derived transitive verbs, just how you can derive a couple of classes of transitive verbs. And we'll also talk about relational nouns and prepositions and adverbs. Uh, these topics, we kind of covered them before. I just wanted to come back and give you a few more examples. Uh, before we get there, uh, there are a few glyphs of the day, just very common syllables. You've seen them before. We'll come back to this one uh, today. There's some examples with it. Uh, this is syllable sa. It looks very similar to kak, fire. It's also a bundle of some sort, stack. And, uh, and also to the syllable to. Except that in this case, there is no upper element. And the sign can be split along the middle. So you can sometimes see just the half of it. This is a syllable pa. And it's actually not black. It's really cross-hatching in painting and in carving. It basically shows a piece of net. We don't know why, but ancient Mayas thought that men dressed in full-body net suits are funny. And so Maya clowns look like people dressed in full-body net suits with very large, exaggerated noses and they carry rattles. There's a whole article written about what Maya clowns look like. So the full form of this sign is a whole fellow looking like that, and that's just a piece of that. So that's the syllable pa. The syllable mo is very generic, it's just a bunch of dots. And uh, in later inscriptions, it is tied to the eye of the macaw. They do have feathers. Uh, around the eye, and the word for macaw is mo. But early macaw eyes look different, and also kopal, uh, pom, uh, looks very much like that, like incense smoke. So I'm not sure what the sign actually represents. Most of the time, it's just a syllable. Then uh, ko and all of those are common. O is the feather of the o bird. It's some kind of mythical creature, like dragon. So we don't know what kind of bird it actually is. We know that in colonial times, it is frequently mentioned in incantations. So on Wednesday, we'll talk a little bit more about magic um, and, and incantations. And so the old bird is there a lot. So we know people imagined it somehow up into early colonial times, but there are no depictions of the old bird apart from my hieroglyphs. And it looks like a generic owl like bird. Then you have ko, which is actually a turtle carapace, like a little turtle. There's actually a word for turtle, which is kok. Uh, and, and, and this just seems to be like a little carapace with, with openings. So a certain kind of turtle. And then lo and cheat. We're not sure how to translate the word cheat. We can read it just fine because there's so many phonetic substitutions. But it's an attribute of gods and parents. Um, so cheat. And uh, when you do a sacrifice, uh, it can also be cheat. And as a law, it's just a syllable. And a lot of signs, of course, are modeled after the same shape. It basically represents an egg or a seed or a bulb of a flower. This is the assignment uh, that we did, the, the pronouns. And, and this is the original text, not the one I provided in addition to that sort of simplified version. It's really interesting because this is an example of an incredibly cursive writing style. And it shows us that there were handwriting styles during the classic period. You could really write rapidly with Maya glyphs. So the fact that they have all these complex shapes, just as calligraphy, as monuments, there was cursive hieroglyphic mind, very much like there was cur cursive hieroglyphic Egyptians, we call it erotic. Um, so, it's interesting, though, this is a carved text. So this is a text that was deliberately carved to look like that because carving is a gradual process. You mark the inscription, then you start working on it with limestone tools, uh, abrasive drills, uh, flintstone, chert tools, and then finally obsidian tools, and then you polish it. So it's a very complicated process, and archaeologists actually reconstructed it using experimental archaeology. So to make it look like someone just scribbled it with a tip of a brush, that's high quality. And it's no surprise that the person who carved it, who owned the shell, 
calls himself Bacheb. Oh, sorry, Bacheb. Literally, head brush. So he's the chief royal artist. And this person left us several amazing objects. The most recently, uh, no, I cannot say discovered because it surfaced up in a private collection in Guatemala. It's a, it's a marble vessel with, with exquisite text. Most likely the tomb of this person was looted sometime 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And so since then, these objects surfaced in various private collections, unfortunately. He was a chief artist of the king of the what we now today today know as the ancient site of uh, Pomona. The ancient name was Parbul. So he served uh, the king whose name was something like Jewel Jaguar. And, and even though these inscriptions have no dates, since we know the name of the patron and, and approximately years of his reign, that gives us uh, approximate dates when this great artist lived. And so this text is, is unusual in that it contains just syllables with one single exception. And that logogram that has recently been de deciphered as whole or like cavity, that's probably the pun of the joke. And perhaps this is why it is a logogram. It has to be semantically clear. Because, you know, with pun, it's not just about the sound, but meaning. And the text says, a wu li li, and I replaced wu with hu. Wu seems to be a local Western dialect. Uh, he sounds either disappear or become glides in the way local language was spoken. So instead of saying hab, they say ab. Instead of saying uhti, they say uti. And instead of saying huli, probably they were actually saying uli. And so awuleli instead of ahuleli. So I replaced it. Your arrival with a clitic has been your arrival. Ta ni, and this is actually home, ta ni homal met into my holy, holy as in with a hole, like a holy nest, or into my cavity nest. And this is a parrot sitting in the window of a house. Uh, so I guess, and, and the pun was supposedly in the homal word. He's describing his nest, which is not a nest. And then you have yalan. He says in the incompletive, so it's an action that is not over. Op, parrot, says the parrot, yal he hub, as the shell said. We know that these anecdotes are about a talking conch shell. So a talking conch shell makes, makes kind of social commentaries about people. In another scene, the conch shell is talking to a deer who is smoking. And the conch shell says, Breathing out air is so much work for you. Because apparently the person is not doing anything. And here, the parrot is not at the parrot's nest. The parrot is at home. And he presumably complains about the quality of the nest. It's like holy nest. So like a nest with a cave or a sunken nest, something about his nest. And he is just enjoying life of a domestic parrot, basically. And so the conch shell is parroting the parrot. So it's kind of joking or teasing the parrot. So it's the shell saying what the parrot is saying. With a pun. Got a question? Yeah, were people keeping domestic parrots? Like they did. And, and of course, that's tradition that extends up north. So people in Chaco Grande kept domestic parrots. And we only can guess how they learned how to feed macaws properly, because macaws are one of those birds whose feathers actually fade if their, di if their diet is, is not right, because their pigment is colorant, it's not structural. So if you don't feed them well, the, the, the color of the fade, the, the, the color of the feathers actually fades. Uh, and so, yes, they kept parrots, uh, they kept agoutis, coatis, uh, and um, and perhaps other animals as well, deer, for example. Um, uh, we, of course, see images of pet jaguars. And of course, there are plenty of dogs. And I'm sure they could keep occasional ocelot, like a smaller uh, felines. But uh, 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 parrots almost certainly. And it's not hard to keep a domestic parrot. I mean, you can, you, you, unless, they are driven out of their pack. 
and they go searching for stuff, they'll probably stay in one place. And they eat mostly their things that human eats. Yeah, and if, and if you trim their feathers, they will not fly away, obviously. I worked for many years at the archaeological site of Copan, and there is a, a large pack of macaws. And this is obviously not a macaw, this is a smaller parrot. This is a talking parrot. Uh, and and uh, at first, local custodians trimmed their feathers because they were worried the birds would fly away and injure themselves, caught or killed by poachers. Eventually, some ornithologists recommended to stop clipping the wings because the archaeological zone is the last area of continuous forest left. And for miles around, it's all agricultural fields. So parrots look around and they see that there's nowhere to go. <laughs> and they don't leave. And that's apparently still the case. So now the parrots, the macaw parrots, they fly around the park. Every, every sunset, they do fly by as a whole pack, which is kind of nice to watch. The only problem is actually they, their sounds are horrible. Because they're, they're meant to hear each other across large expanses of the forest. And it's not about how beautiful it sounds, but how loud and like, piercing. Uh, so it's one of those cases when the look of a bird and the sound of the bird, they kind of don't really match at all. Uh, and so here we have hoob. And then hooch is another word for shell, but not it's not conch shell. It's a spondylus shell. So here the person is also playing with words. So sad. The shell, and then actually have a new sentence. It is the shell of, and then this little doubler here, Popolzi, that's the name of the person, literally, reedy dog. Or perhaps mat, mattish dog, like the dog who likes sitting on the mat. And that's a personal name, and that's someone who is non royal, right? So all their royal names are about gods or mighty animals, and this is just Popolzi. And he is Ba Chebu, Ba Cheb, had brush. So he must have had some kind of atelier workshop of painters who would be painting murals. So that would be the person designing, uh, like a head designer, head artist at the royal court, in charge of plenty new murals, stucco facades. And in spare time, he was making little shells with jokes that he liked so much that some of them ended up in his grave. This is someone who wanted to be buried with some, with a couple of good jokes. Must have been a wonderful person. Um, so this was an extra credit assignment, and it's it's a it's an early classic text. I create a simplified version from Copan, and it says Uka Buch, and there is a doubler here because the U is supposed to appear twice. So his land, his cave or city, three times eleven four hundred years, Lord. So Lord of Time, an extended period of time. Some archaeologists argue that it refers to the procession of the equinoxes. There's, if you try to divide the procession cycle, it kind of roughly fits this. It's a bit complicated. Uh, and it, it, it is counted in years, but there's also a shorter cycle, which is about half of the procession uh, that uh, is being celebrated on several monuments, including those at Naranjo. And it has this name. And then you have Nitagbuch. I replaced it, or I put it in order. So suddenly, the I is there. It's one of those speeches by the king. So it is his land and his city, the lord of time. I put it in order, presumably the city, or perhaps the position in the city. And then, Ukaphi, Bolont Akbul, or Bolont Akab, Kuh, or Kuhul, and then the title of the Kopan king. So the eternal Kopan ruler, or the eternal god, had commanded it. And that's something about ancestors we'll talk about on Wednesday, that people describe their motivation as the will of the ancestors, or the, god, or the gods. I do it because the gods want it. The gods commanded me, or the ancestors commanded me. And in this case, the person states this very clearly. This belongs to the ancestors. I just fixed it because the ancestors commanded me. So that's how Maya rulers essentially justified their action, uh, their actions. So this is our last week. We talked about the voices of transitive verbs. But there are four voices, active, passive. Those are easy to understand. Utsutsu, he closed, usually talking about the time periods. He terminated. Tsutsa, it was closed. And it can be spelled Tsutsa ha or Tsutsa ha. 
Two chai is an ambiguous spelling because it doesn't tell you what kind of vowel is in the suffix. Uh, it could be tutu, for example, with a glottalized vowel, but the scribes want consistency in the spelling of the suffix of intransitive verbs. And that seems to be one of those partially morphemic spellings of suffixes. And then tutui, or tutsi with a clitic, got closed, middle voice, a category that exists semantically in English but is not marked grammatically. And then finally, you would have he finishes in general. We don't have examples of anti passive in these contexts. It's not very, it's not a very common context uh, to describe habitual period ending of any kind. And then with the irregular transitives, uh, the only difference is that uh, the passive voice is, is formed differently. The N is inserted in front of the ah, and nothing happens to the root. Uh, and, and that applies to verbs whose root is irregular. Or ushul, for example, has actually two roots, carved polish, together. Uh, so the passive would be ushul nahal or ushul bahal. And then the middle voice can also be formed differently with a ah suffix. And then the anti-passive is a long vowel n, usually the same vowel as the root, the, the preceding syllable. So uk, to drink. Uk o would be he drinks it. Uk un would be he drinks as in drunking, drinking. Uh, so activity. Now returning to today's topic. First, I want to talk about derived transitives, prepositions then uh, some relational nouns, and finally, adverbs. So this is the root tak, and it literally means two things, to sum things up or bring things together, or to be in order, or to be in sequence. So it's a, either transitive or positional. And as a positional root, it can also be used as a numeral classifier. So here the person says, uh, ho ya, he debuts we struggle with this verb we know that it refers to people standing in front of a mirror and putting on clothing there's quite a few images of that dressing up there is no gloss in modern languages today that fits the pronunciation of this this verb uh, and so there are different interpretations like be dressed like a passive voice but that of course implies that we know what what it's a transitive verb and then <laughs> good candidates uh, some uh, scholars, like late Alfonso Lacadena, suggest that it relates to Yucatec gloss that actually means to appear for the first time, like to make a debut, like an artist, like a theater actor, like the first time you do a performance. And that kind of fits known context. And that would be like a trans a, a, an intransitive verb derived from that. It's like to make one, to do one, or to become one. It's like a, to become a debutant. Uh, and, and so in this case, the person is debuting in royalty in kingship uh of course without the preposition uh this is a kind of abbreviated text yash pasach chan yopat uh and then wak lahun 16th tzak. and tzak here is a numeral classifier in order of something like in the dynasty in this case the so 16th dynastic chahom uh, we don't know how to read the kopan emblem so we still Say Kopan, probably Tsipipo or Shupip. So here it's Ak is just a positional root. Now I can derive a transitive verb out of this root. So it's Ak as a positional, presumably it's Akwan or Tsakwa, even though we don't have examples of that in the script, uh, would be to, to be in place, to be, to be positioned in a particular place. Now, it's agbu would be to place something in order or to replace something. So the intransitive verb tsakwano, tsaklak, becomes a transitive. Tsakbu. So that bu is a transitivizing causative suffix. So to make someone do something, in this case, to assume a certain place. So in that example that we just saw, right, neat agbu. I replaced it, or it is my replacing, or placement. Bolont agbul, that's participle. So it's not bolont ak, it's not the ninth king, is nine as in many, many replaced lord, literally eternal lord. Bolont akab also means eternity, according to some colonial Yucatec dictionaries. 
So king's eternal, and usually it's an attribute of ancestors, of course. Countless generations, that seems to be the idea. Or here, you have a dedication of an object. Unfortunately, we still don't know how to read this hieroglyph, but it refers to a particular kind of offerings or altars. This is a set of four altars marking this cruciform thing that they're talking about. So part one, it takes shape. And then U, his snake, this. U kabach, or U kabhi, with a clitic, as he had ordered it. And then the name of the same king is, as here, as, as here right? Yash Pasach Chan Yopat. Holy Lord of Kopan. So here it's just a positional, regular position verb. So now I can make a transitive verb out of it, and it will be patbu, to shape something. So in this case, you have it abai, then it goes up. So middle voice or general state, change of state in transitive, abai. You shul wahal, the carved, polished thing. As you have tzibnahal, this is you shul wahal. Of u sibik tunil, the painted stone. Of and then the weird name of whatever was on that altar. It says Ma to Sam or maybe Ma Satom. It shall not be lost. I don't know, maybe the king had a had something that he kept losing. So he finally put an altar, and whatever shall not be lost was placed on that altar and remained there and wasn't lost then uh, for quite some time. I'm not sure how to read that. But then you have Upadbuch. He shapes it. And probably they don't really mean that the king carved an altar. What they're probably referring is to make things happen. Because patlach also has a significance of to take place, like as in occurring. As we would say in English, it took place three days ago. We don't really mean that it took a specific place. It just happened. Same thing happens in my inscriptions. They use patlach as it happened. And in this case, the king made it happen. So he made it happen. And of course, the same name, Yash Pasach Chan Yopat. And then Uba Hilean, he impersonated a god. That's the other part of the text. It's not relevant here. There is another causative. And, and the story here is interesting because we became aware of this causative very recently. This is an article from 2019. 2000, 2014, I presented a paper with another example of that causative suffix in the name of the Naranjo King, Ahmed Zachchan Mitch, and about half of my colleagues were not convinced. So it's really amazing from 2014 to 2019, the opinion shifted. Mark Zender published this article in 2019 with more examples of the causative as say, and now it's an established, it's an established fact. So uh, the causative itself means pretty much the same thing as boo. Bu occurs mostly with positional verbs. So it's but place. Se occurs with intransitives, root intransitives. For example, abai is to go up. Abse, as in here, is to lift. Chami is to die. Chamse is to kill, to make someone die, to make someone do something. In this particular example, it's a bench of a palace. And the text starts with abai. So it goes up, it is raised, and then the carving of the bench of this house. And then the owner of the house is mentioned. And then his grandpa, grandparent, or perhaps ancestor, more remote ancestor, is also man, mentioned. And his name is Umtishok. Um mouthed shark, uh, probably foam, like sea foam or ocean foam mouthed shark. And, and uh, what is interesting here is you have Utapse, he raised it. So they return to the dedication of the monument. And they see they, ra they raised it, Yokol, above. That's a relational noun. We'll talk more about it later. A home, uh, literally censor, but it's a sacrificial priest. And this is one of the few examples of the full, full body logogram that actually shows what a scribe thought the priest should be. That's very unusual. 
So you see an individual who has this very distinct habit that actually has sprouts coming out of it. The idea is that priests, they don't wash their hair as a form of penance up to the point that plants start sprouting. And this is not just Maya. We have similar descriptions of Aztec priests at the time of the Spanish conquest. And if you think that it's weird, remember, holy men in Christian tradition live in caves and they don't wash. And there's a particular kind of holy man in early medieval times when a saint or a holy person lives on a pole, like a column, like in a little booth, exposed to the wind, sun, everything. And everything that person defecates, urinates, all stays in there. It's like a form of extreme devotion. And the person is covered in scavenge and everything. And it's not uncommon in the narratives about these holy men when somebody comes petitioning for help, the person like throws some stuff off his body and then as it falls, it becomes gold or jewels. But the idea is that it's more the mortification of the flesh, like the flesh doesn't matter. So in sort of traditional core Christian tradition is very strong, this notion that basically people who are who mortify their flesh to the point that it's decaying, is damaged, who renounce their existence to the point of living in, in a barrel on top of a column, right? Exposed to everything and suffering. They are the closest to God. So this is our Christian tradition. And Amaya priests apparently also showed their level of devotion by allowing plants grow in their hair. Because they're so concentrated on the holiness, right? On the, the life of the gods. And this person is also putting incense here you have the syllable mo, one of the glyphs of the day, and then uh, the syllable po inside it. So it's pom, the word for incense, for kopal, into an incense burner. And that's how incense burners look like at kopal, at kopan, the, their little uh, ceramic vessels with little spikes imitating young saber trees. Because that's what the trunk of this young saber tree is like. It's covered with very sharp spikes, uh, like triangular in shape. And so incense burners, they represent growing saber trees because the saber is one of the largest trees in the forest and it reaches the sky. It's one of the world trees. So this person is a priest. So it sounds like a weird statement, like how can he be raising, presumably the bench above his ancestor? There is a tomb underneath that shrine or palace. And it contains one of the earliest burials in the whole architectural group where that palace is located. We have every reason to believe that that's Umti Shok. So he literally raised the bench or raised the carved bench above his ancestor. It's not a metaphor. They're very literal uh, in, in, this, in this text. There is another example of Tab where instead of Tabai, you have a transitivized form. In this case, hin, but not as hin me as for me, but hin as a demonstrative pronoun. This, this they raise ab san for tun itsam. Itsam is spelled very strangely, but as far that's all we can say for now. Which grammatical form is that? Can someone tell me? It's not ut abse, he raised it. Here you have this, they raise, absan, the anti-passive. It is the anti-passive. And it kind of sounds very awkward, like why should be an anti-passive here? But imagine that you want to say, that is, this is what I do. So after you say do, you cannot actually add a patient. And you can say, it is what I do, right? It is, is already a sentence. It is what I do. And so to the Maya, that's, that kind of context apparently reclassifies this verb as intransitive because after hin, it can no longer take another patient, another object. And hin is moved essentially into a separate phrase. This is, or it is, or thus, or that, 
that is what they lift. And so lift here is anti-passive now because of this. They moved the patient to a separate phrase, and now they reclassify the verb as intransitive to anti-passive. This is what they lift. And you can see they're actually lifting a lot of things. Unfortunately, it's not clear what they lift. That part, part of the text is eroded, but apparently they're listing what they're lifting, as often happens. Unfortunately, it's eluded fast, so I've never seen it myself. There are some photos circulating, circulating among certain epigraphers. I'm not one of them, so I can only rely on this publication for the image. And here's another great example of uh, a transitivized intransitive that you've seen many times. Huli is to arrive, so you've seen that verb quite a bit. Hules or hulesa is to make someone arrive, like as in resettle or bring. And in this case, the text goes on day six wind, day five of the month of Yarsi home. Kahai, so one of those middle voice or more likely change of state intransitives, literally to settle. So in this case, he settled or they settled at Aktun. Aktun is a word for cave, but presumably here it's just a, a place name, the caves. Uh, they settled in Aktun. And then you have another anti-passive, Hulsan, very much like Absan. Here it's Hulsan. They, he brought them, or they brought, or not them, sorry. He brought, or they brought, or they moved, or he moved. And then Aksak Nikte, uh, Mark Zen suggests that Aksak Nikte is basically like a separate sentence, like those were people of Sak Nikte. But you can also translate as people of Sak Nikte moved in the sense that that settlement of Aktun was when people of Sak Nikte moved or resettled. So in this case, it's one of the few examples when we explicitly described how Maya rulers forcibly resettled people commanded people to resettle in different towns. So social or spatial mobility for the Maya was not necessarily a personal decision or a family decision. Government sometimes told people to essentially move and occupy strategic locations. Yes, exactly. So for the Maya, we thought that the Maya kingdoms didn't have bureaucracies or enough authority and like brutal like force power to actually forcibly move people around. We always assume that it just happened because people wanted better opportunities, kind of nice capitalist view of free peasants, like going around, following some charismatic rulers. This is more sort of down to earth explanation how new settlements appear and disappear. And Maya kings basically deciding that town goes over there and that town goes over here. And, and it's interesting that this is all still done by the king before he formally accedes to kingship. It happens 19 days later on the day uh, 12 Imish for Sak Hoyahti Hao Lil, presumably, or Hao Lil. The suffix is underspelled. So he debuts in kingship. So he does all those things, presumably, some kind of junior administrator yet. And then uh, after that, handling a mess of resettlement, he's promoted to high office, basically. So kind of, uh, he gets his reputation after finishing a resettlement project. Well, kind of reasonable, right? Like the rest of the girls is probably, okay, he's ready. It's time to promote him to kingship. Um, this is another great example of um, that causative suffix, but it is also, uh, an interesting case when something that we do not necessarily classify in a certain way is perceived as related by the Mayas. So this is a trumpet and that is a belt pendant. They are the same kind of thing for the Maya. Of course, it's a trumpet and that thing is also called Kaivak Tun, like a storm stone. But both are UKS literally uh, moaning or weeping or make weep things. So the gloss ok or ok means to cry like a baby, but also sounds that cat makes, that cats make or cows make. So I guess like non-human sounds basically, or like not adult human sound, sounds. 
and your S is to make something, make those sounds. And there is a gloss for op trumpet in Saltal that seems to be directly related. But it appears that classic period inscriptions refer to a wider class of objects, not just trumpets. So we don't necessarily think of pendants as musical instruments. You may remember that I mentioned that they, may, they actually make a very specific like uh, clicking sound, very much like little bells uh, when you wear them, when you dance. And, and sometimes they're marked with the sign for wind in art, suggesting that they are emitting sound. But it's interesting here, they are explicitly classified as a musical instrument. And that is very important to us because to say that something can potentially make a sound is one thing. That's just a speculation, a hypothesis. We can say Maya value jade for its sound, but it's not backed by anything, just the fact that it makes sound. But here we have a jade pendant that explicitly states this is something making sound, strange sound, like weeping sound. Uh, but nonetheless, so for the Maya, both of both objects, the trumpet and the jade pendant, they're the same class of things. And it's interesting, they're not described as lahbar or lahib, which would be like a term for some of the drums, like lahbar is music. They're not that. Uh, there is something else. Now, um, I already mentioned prepositions. I'll just come back to it a little bit. Remember, uh, there is only one sort of general preposition in my text, and there is a variation. Sometimes it's ta, sometimes it's t. We don't understand the difference between ta and t. It may well be dialectal. Um, ta seems to be earlier too. And the same preposition can be location, can be instrument, and can be direction. But for the most part, direction is not indicated by preposition in contrast to English, because we have a lot of prepositions in, out, with. It's a lot less complex when it comes to my prepositions because it's the verbs themselves which carry direction. So to come to and to come from are different verbs. That's very important to remember. So people probably think of prepositions very differently if you're a Maya speaker. And of course, today, when a lot of Maya speakers are bilingual, I suspect there's more overlap with Indo-European prepositions. So say HRT today used takar a lot, which means with. Um, and we don't really see any takar in hieroglyphic inscriptions or, or its equivalent, though we do see hita as a relational noun. So, Tali is from, Ahme is from, to come from, to descend from, to escape from. Now, what do you do, what do you do when you want to say he ran away? In Chorti today, they would say, look, Oyahni, he escaped running. But you cannot simply to say he ran from somewhere because there's no way to say from. It has to be embedded in the verb. So, but it's okay to say, look, oyakni, and that would imply from somewhere, because look, o is from, and look, oyakni would be like escape, running. Bishin is two, abai is two, huli is, is also two. And for some of these verbs, we have full pairs, like huli, tali. For some of them, we don't, just because the typical discourse doesn't provide us with uh, these verbs. But in present day HRT, most of the verbs can be paired this way. So to and from, or sometimes you can create couplets like look oyakni that will provide you with the desired significance, but not the prepositions. That's very important. And the prepositions would always stay the same. So here, the uh, first god of the Palenque tried, hun ye nal winik probably Akum Chak, Father Chak, is one, one reading of his name. Uh, the, the first tooth maze place person, 
uh, he's got a pretty big shark tooth. Um, but uh, the fatherly chuck, so he's not descending at the sky. That would be impossible. He is descending from the sky. But ta is just the locative. It doesn't give you direction. The verb itself has direction. In, in the upper example, you have the date on the day 5 ab, day 15 of the month of Mak. Uba, it is his image. Ti tabil or tabal. Ti achkal hul. In penance with the fiery spear. So in and with, there is no difference. And it's interesting that the king himself in the scene is not doing any bloodletting. He is just holding the torch above his wife who is piercing the tongue. So the king is not doing mayich. He is just in ab, participating, but indirectly, it seems. So the same preposition is in and with in the same inscription. Or you keep tayutal ishim tel cacao, the drinking utensil for fruity cacao. But it can also be with fruity cacao in the sense that it contains fruity cacao. There is no way to distinguish between the two translations uh, in the language of the inscriptions. And in fact, in most Mayan languages, whether it's for or with, even though today's Turkey has twa, which is like for, but that's to me seems to be more of a an indication of long contact with Spanish that you really have to indicate those things constantly. Um, and then um, hummingbird is talking to the king of gods, and it says yalhi as the hummingbird says yalhi tsunun ti tam kokach as the hummingbird speaks to the king of gods. And if you think that it's strange, well, I'm a native speaker of Russia. To me, it's hard to distinguish sometimes when the speakers of English use to or with. So speak to or speak with. There is no direct equivalence in Russian because it's always with and never to. So speak or talk to. You're not supposed to say talk with me, you're supposed to say talk to me, but you can speak with someone, but also to someone. So that 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 difference that prepositions have uh, here does not exist at all, right? It's just T that can be, can be pretty much anything, but it's not particularly unusual if you consider other languages. Another interesting logative is Tahan, it literally means chest, but as a logative probably either in front or more likely in the midst of something, like in the center of something. And it has two interesting varieties. When, uh, the ob when the place in question is mostly landlocked, the locative would be tahan like in the midst of the wells or the caves. If the, uh, the location is mostly surrounded by water, it would be tanha. So we don't see Tanha very often, as you can imagine. Uh, the, the peninsula of Yashchilan is surrounded by water on nearly all four sides because the peninsula is, is shaped like this. So you're almost on an island. So Pachan, the name of this place, is Tanha. The site of Motul de San Jose is on the largest lake in northern Guatemala, Lake Piten. So it's also Tanha. You can also say Tiha at the edge of water. That we see at uh, Yasha. You may remember the name of, the full name of the ancient city of Yasha. Tiyash Kukha, at the edge of the water, blue green as the feathers of Ketal. So T there is also locative, like edge. And this is interesting. We don't know where Baakal is. It's not the site of Palenque where the lords of Baakal lived. We know it because, well, uh, they called Palenque Lakamha and Toktan. So Baakal is a remote location 
perhaps still a real location. Events are still happening there from time to time. In real, real events, people meet someone, for example. But it's Tanha. That implies perhaps that this is a coastal site or a site by a massive lake. There are no massive lakes in that area or peninsulas of any kind in the Sumasinta River. So I'd suspect that Bakal is probably somewhere on the coast. And Bakal means literally the place of bones or fossils. And as a place for some kind of coastal beach where you have fossil, say, shark teeth. Uh, it, it's a very appropriate name, like the place of bones in that sense, like not re like real bones, but more like fossil bones. Uh, a less common locative with a similar meaning is shin, uh, like in the middle, so tashin in the middle, and it occurs in only a couple of examples. Uh, two of them are unfortunately looted vassals from probably the grave of the same person who was a lakam, like a, a district official of a place called Yotz. We still don't know where Yotz is or Yom Pitz. There are different readings of the, of the, of the place name. Somewhere not far where I, for, from where I work. So every time we start digging at a new site, we think, could it be Yotz? Uh, last time we worked at the site called Church Kitam. And that was last summer. And we thought that maybe we had Yotz. Turned out that it wasn't. But uh, it was still an important site, also mentioned in the hieroglyphic inscriptions. Uh, when we excavated the site of Witsna, we thought maybe it was Yotz. It turned out to be a different site named Balamhol. So Yotz is still out there somewhere. Um, but looters, no, unfortunately. Uh, uh, so looters uh, went into the graves of Yotz rulers. So we have quite a few objects uh, owned by lords of Yotz or Yompits. Yom um, so this particular fellow is Tashin Chana Hao, and his name is spelled fully on, on this vessel, Tashi Ni Chan Hao, probably with La below. And here it's abbreviated, Tashi Ni Chan Na. And he's Ba Kelem, head youth, presumably head warrior of some sort. And then he's Ba Kap, first on earth, and he is the Lakam of the king of Yotz. And he is simply called Ah Yotz or Yom Pitz, he of, or Yomotz, uh, he of that place. So he lived there and he probably died there where the looters found him, unfortunately. Uh, and so Tashin Chanahao would be something like Lord in the middle of the sky, presumably the sun. So nice, nice name. And it's interesting that they could abbreviate it to Tashin Chan. He in the middle of the sky. Relational nouns, you've seen relational nouns before. This is each now, very easy to understand, in front of someone. Yitak, together with, or perhaps it means he accompanied or he, she accompanied it or him or them. And then upat, behind, so t plus ergative plus pat. Two upat would be in its back, behind it. So relational nouns are very common in present-day Maya languages because a lot of relationships in space or between objects are expressed through relational nouns. You may remember that statement. Nawah, ishwinik habahau, ishnamanahau, yichnal, nichyonal ak. The lady, Katun, lady of Naman, was presented, or literally, became presented, became the presentation in front of Yichnal before Nichonal Ak. Now, if I wanted to say Nawach Ishwinikabahau Yitach Nichonal Ak, what would that mean? Instead of Yichnal, Yitach. Yeah, so it means they both became the presentation. What if I wanted to say Nawach Ishwinikabahau to Pat Knishonalak? There are two possible translations. So what would they be? So behind or after. So how would you translate it? Lady Katun Lord of Naman. 
presented to Pat Kinichinalak. So what are the options? Yeah, so first Kinichinalak I got presented and then she got presented. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that it happened behind him, right? Literally, like behind. And then, of course, what would some my speaker say today to Pata would mean literally behind something. Of course, you've seen that example, Ichnal, in front of the holy man. So that whole space is Ichnal. And it's interesting that a lot of my architecture can be analyzed in terms of where the Ichnal say of buildings is or monuments. And some people tried to analyze spaces at Maya cities in terms of this field of view. And it sometimes can be extended to relationships between sites. So how you can see certain places from, say, the tallest temple uh, in your city. Okol or Akol is also a relational noun. That means above. And it's still very much in use in, in, uh, in Cholan languages. Okol uh, or Yakol, there seems to be a variation, like dialectal variation. Some people pronounce this okol and some people pronounce this as yakol. So this object, this object we, we talked about, this is part of the altar queue. The, the altar honoring the founder of the dynasty of Kopan. And it says, Abai, it is raised or gets raised. Yakol, above. And once again, this is a literal statement. So this is the plaza of the west court of the Copan Acropolis, where the altar is located. This is the temple. And somewhere here is the tomb of the founder. There are many construction layers uh, which raise the level of the plaza many meters above the original settlement where the tomb of the founder of the dynasty is. The altar is here. So the makers of the altar were perfectly aware of that. So they knew that deep within, underneath all those structures, there is a, a grave. So they say they raised this altar above him. Very much like that bench was above the tomb of the ancestor. This altar was also above the tomb of the ancestor. So these relationships were very important to the Maya. And we'll talk more about ancestors on Wednesday. And the same text, so this is the part about the altar getting raised in front, uh, sorry, above Nietzsche Kukmo. Here we have Hili uh, Okel, and we don't know whether it's like one verb or actually two verbs glued together as kind of intransitive, but rest, foot, or his foot rested, depending on where you assume the missing prefixes and suffixes are. The author of this inscription doesn't like suffixes. He spelled akol as yako, dropping the final L. And he does the same thing with okel, dropping the final L. Maybe that's how he spoke, or she spoke, or whoever they were carving that altar. Uh, but it's the foot rested the foot of a wheel rested and they're talking about the founder of the dynasty he is the essence of kingship that moved and engendered the, the line of kings so he's a wheel and his feet rested when he arrived and then they the the they say in kalumte the kalumte of the west the supreme king yita huli and here they use yita to accompany but they combine it with huli and that probably means uh, a slightly different verb in the sense like uh, together or with that he arrived. We, we know that there is a variant of this verb, tzakhuli. So they take uh, the verb tzak uh, and, and they combine it with huli. Same idea, presumably, with that he arrived or together with this he arrived or maybe even just and, like we would say in English, and he arrived. And that seems to be the function. So here, it's almost like an adverb. Uh, 
That's how it functions. It connects two sentences which are related. And he arrives in Ushwintik, which is the Asian name of uh, Kopan, uh, the city, or even perhaps the, that section of the valley. In, in this example, Hitach literally means to accompany more directly. Uh, and you've seen that text before. Our red flintstone turtle death. Remember, red, red flintstone is his personal name. Turtle death, that's just the whole family. It's like a surname. His dad was also a turtle death. Uh, uh, so he is dancing Aktach uh, in Sak Yakna, a white tobacco strength house. And then the text continues. Yita yonalak kuhulyo kibahau tiush hablat. He accompanied him, yonalak, king, divine king of Yokib, in the third year, presumably, of his reign. So here, the assumption is that the king was there, and he didn't order the dance. He was in the dance as a companion. He descended to the level of our protagonist. They were in it together. So it's a much closer relationship than merely, say, each now of the king. That will be just the king watched our, our friend dancing. No, they danced together. And so it must have been an exceptional order. And that's why it's on, 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 on his funeral monument. He really wanted it to be there. It's the highlight of his, his life. He actually danced with the king. As companions. So Yita carries the significance of people of similar rank or people assuming the same rank for, for the time being. And of course, for somebody who is not royalty, that would be a very special event. This is slightly different. This is a military narrative from the kingdom of the white dog. We don't know why it was the kingdom of the white dog, but there was a city of the white dog, and there were the lords of the white dog. Uh, and the text says, in uh, in two days, on the day Tukan, uh, Sri Chikchan, they were captured, or he was captured, Chukach, Hun Mai Akmo, Lord of Ake. And then you have Yitach. You have Yitach Yap Awil Ach Anul. And it's interesting, you have the place named Kanul, like place of many serpents. This is Kanul with a glottal, place of many yellow things, or the place of many shells, or precious shells, or money. You can translate it differently. I like the notion of the place where money abounds. Uh, so that, uh, that Yab Awil from the place of many precious things he accompanied and so here it's an ambivalent statement does it mean that yap kawil was also captured does it mean that he was there when it happened but he was neither captured nor nor was he anyone capturing the text is inherently ambivalent here and it becomes clear why on uh, the following day we see perka and it literally means to be summoned uh, so the king summons you and you perkah. That's the passive voice. And the list begins with the same yap awil from the place of many shells, but then many other individuals. They all are summoned perkah, each now in front of Abchante, Lord of Sakti. And so some people interpreted it as, well, yap awil also got captured but he got himself a better deal than the unfortunate Hun Maya Kumo, who probably got beheaded or something along those lines. Uh, he just switched allegiances. So then he was summoned. It is also possible that they really want to mention that Yap Kawil was in that battle. But he wasn't the one capturing it, but that was the king. But he was there. He assisted. It's almost like he distinguished himself, himself in in that conflict, like honorary mention. The, the Hun Mayakmo was captured, Yap Kawil gets honorary mention. And then the king summons all of his vessels to celebrate, including Yap Kawil. So there are two possible explanations. And unfortunately, uh, the narrative itself doesn't clarify. And we actually never hear of these people again. 
maybe they were all captured and then, you know, mad, rather unfortunate and, uh, uh, you know, at the hands of the king. Uh, this text from Narako, you've seen it before, uh, the king of Narako, Hoyak Tipitz, on the day of his accession, dresses for the ball game, and he's very much dressed for the ball game. And then the text goes, Ukabach, they commanded him, Tunk Abhish Achsakil, Hud something Chan, Ukaikan, for successive Tzagbul, so they used the transitivized Tzag, presumably as a participle here, with the missing suffix, Holy Kanul Lords, and they drop the suffix again. There's no suffix on Kanul. And then you have Yita, also without a suffix. This writer doesn't like suffixes. Yita Pita. And so this is harder to interpret. So they commanded him, and you can see that there is no clitic, which means it's not about one event, the Drasen event. It's in general. Like they commanded him. And, and of course, that's why four successive kings are mentioned. This is a retrospective text. This is not the text about the day when he acceded to kingship, really. It's towards the end of his reign, several decades later, almost 40 years later, in fact. He's mentioning all the overlords he had over that, those years, when they all commanded him. And then Yita Pitzich or Pizza is either he accompanied them as a ball player, so pitach would be like an agentive suffix, or perhaps it's a verb. He played ball together with them. So once again, this is something about a special relationship of a different sort than sort of being simply a vessel. What he wants to say is that he developed some kind of mutual understanding with his overlords, like a team. And it's interesting, this is not the only example of this particular metaphor that we see over and over from the same time period. What happens, many Maya kingdoms are conquered at the same time by the Kanul royal family. And that kind of creates a problem of rhetoric because each Maya king is listening to his gods and his ancestors, mostly his ancestors. And suddenly they're all vassals and they listen to some dude far away in southern Quintana Roo, Mexico. And that's and, and how you explain it, I mean, how you explain that you're a member of something that just came into existence, that doesn't feed into an existing rhetoric of rulership and, and loyalty and who you're supposed to listen to and who you all are. And somehow bulging becomes a way of expressing this communion. Because during the game, all other relationships are temporarily suspended, right? You're just one team with a goal to win, very much like in our game. We're all tied. So these guys use game as a way of expressing membership in a new political entity. They're all the same team. And we see monuments celebrating that at every conquered site. So they all build a stairway or some other monument where they describe how they play ball now with their overlords or with other lords from the same hegemonic network. So it becomes a rhetoric of loyalty expressed through bull game. Like we used to be kings, but now we're proud teammates. We all play ball with each other. Kind of very interesting in terms of how people try to imagine something that didn't exist before, but using categories which were already there. So for some reason, these lords, they seized on bull game as the best analogy, like empire, as a team building exercise, kind of corporate board uh, with proud members. Well, it didn't work out, of course, in the long term, but for about a century, they were all playing ball very happily. Uh, so Ukabach is another potential candidate for a relational noun. The reason being, we almost never see it as a regular verb, like Ukabal, for example, like he ordered. We always see it in the so-called perfective with the, with the ah suffix or with the clitic, so ukabach or ukabhi. And so many scholars argue that this probably means that this is just another relational noun. In fact, in many Mayan languages, there is a similar relational noun. In Shorty, for example, that would be umener, literally he is doing. So when I, when I want to say because of something, the way for me to say it is umener which literally means 
it did it, or he did it, or she did it, or doing. It's like a, it's like a noun, mener, doing. Uh, and so Kabbalah seems to be functioning the same way. And so some people suggested that this is actually a relational noun. I like this explanation. There are some problems with it. Uh, uh, there's this vessel found at Tikal uh, in the Mundo Perdido part of the city, and it has Ni Kaban. And we have a few more examples of that. And of course, it may be still like my land rather than I order. But remember, if Kabah is a perfective form, and Kaba probably would be the regular completive form, and it's an it's an irregular verb basically. It's a derived like same as tiba. So the incompletive should look like this, like I order it. And so these forms like nikaban they're actually quite verbal. They're just rare, but they don't fit into the relational noun theory. People who want it to be a relational noun they say, well, this is just land with additional derivation stuff. It's like my land. It's not like I order. But they suspiciously look like an incomplete aspect of an irregular transitive verb. So I'm still a little bit in doubt here. And then there are relational nouns, which are probably relational nouns. We're not sure. So you've seen this section before. It's about King of Palenque summoning gods. The place where he summons the gods is Yemal Kuklakamwitz. So one possibility is that Yemal is the descent possessed. So echm to descend, echme, someone descending, echmal, descent, yechmal, his descent. So the location is called the Kitzal mountain, the great mountain of the Kitzal's descent. Yemal, uk, lakamwitz. The problem is that there is a relational noun, a very common relational noun, echmar in Chorti, for example, that means below. And when it's possessed, it would be yechmal, just like here. And of course, there's a big difference when you translate something as on top of the mountain of the great, you know, the great mountain of the descent of Kitzal, as opposed to below the mountain, the great mountain of Kitzal. And for example, you want to actually find that temple. As you can imagine, the location would be quite different if the temple is below the great Kitzal mountain, as opposed to on top of the mountain of the Kitzal's descent. Probably like a, a cave location where the chalk rock outcrop is at the foot of the mountain, still above probably the the main uh, city of Palenque, somewhere in the foothills of uh, the mountains of the Chiapas Highlands, but still not the top, but somewhere below the the tip of the, the top section of the mountain. So um, not enough examples yet, but I but kind of like that the, this is probably a relational noun because it's such a common word you see you expect to see it there are also adverbs we don't have a lot of adverbs uh, in maya text uh, this one is on many and it occurs only a couple of times in this scene for example you see there is a hero twin holding a turkey and there's a whole whole pile of bunnies next to it and he's talking to the king of gods with a flower and he says my bunny is a many my turkeys are not. On nitul, many my bunnies. Ma on, not many, walk my turkey. Yal hi hunahau, as hunahau said, ti tsam kokach. And unfortunately, there is another section that is eroded, but apparently an attendant of the court makes a commentary about what the hero twin says. Probably not very favorable. There's too many bunnies, too few turkeys. I try to imagine this probably a taxation scene. Somebody arrives and here are the bunnies, many bunnies, but not many turkeys. You've seen machach, like negative, no, like not there. In this case, it's machach, a wheel, there is no a wheel. So that's another adverb, obviously. And wheel in this case is some kind of imminent force like an energy that disappears. So macha or just ma, no. Uh, Iwal means now or then. It is not very common, but it occurs in that very strange text on Steel J that we discussed during the virtual tour of my sites. 
It's the monument that has a prescriptive text, tells you what to do every year of the 20 year cycle. So this uh, section, for example, says, Ushlahun hab iyuwal makashu tiwai. On the 13th year, then now close the edges of the wells or the chambers. Like you close, like imperative. And it says, Sha, which means again or always on the 13th year. Basically, don't forget to close the edges of the wells. Whatever that means. We don't know. It's the only time when things to be done on the 13th year of the 20 year cycle are mentioned. Nobody bothered except the authors of this inscription. But it, it is prescriptive, and presumably they say they say EU while in the sense that and now and then. It's like you focus your attention, like don't forget what you're supposed to do on the 13th year again. These are uh, adverbs of time, and they mostly occur in calendar context when they describe the lunar cycle. So the moon arrives, and they usually say so, so many days since the moon arrived. But when the month is relatively young, they say since it arrived yesterday. So instead of saying like one day since it arrived, right? They say since it arrived yesterday, Akbi. So Akbi is an adverb. Or Sakhmi, which is literally earlier today. So they're on, they're on the first day of the month, or you're on the second day of the month of the moon. And that's how they would say it. So the second day is since the moon arrived yesterday, and the first day since the moon arrived earlier today. So it's just a, a poetic way. Bani means truly or thus. And that's perhaps the least common uh, adverb. I like it because it is part of this inscription. Someone is really talking about something very assertively. So it goes on, truly something is my penance, my darkness. Truly this jewel are my earrings. Truly, nikaban nichen, which you can translate it as, truly this is my land, this is my city, or perhaps, Truly, I command my city. Like, indeed, I command my city. And this text has a twist, apparently. It goes on, Yalhi Iwatal, as your wives say. So these guys, and they're all guys, they have a problem. And they came to seek a solution. And they're being admonished about perhaps what their spouses are saying uh, about earrings and who is in charge. Uh, perhaps uh, it's very hard to understand what is going on here. But the text continues in the first person. You have Wee Chi here suggesting that the, the person continues talking. And so he's, he's talking to these Itam deities and animals. And they are all very sad. You can see a lot of them are in gestures of sadness. So something is going on, perhaps involving earrings and, and other things. And who commands in the cave, in the city? Um, so uh, this is an example of bani, like emphatic sort of indeed or thus. And it's very common in the narrative, say, towards the conclusion of the narrative, you say, that, and so it happened. So you say, bano, bano, bani, kochera. So it happens, so they say.